like applications with map, applications with rules. So let's see. Um, I made a, a small summary of different applications that are very popular, like different services that are being used to develop applications these days. And we will talk a little bit and demonstrate a little bit about how they work, what features they have. And later on, we will try to implement a small application using, uh, using these, uh, these services. So you might be familiar with, with some of them. Maybe Google Maps is, is quite, quite popular nowadays. And many people use it for, um, for example, for navigation in their cars. So these old navigation systems are starting to become a bit uh, obsolete because now you have Google Maps on your mobile phone and uh, it's maybe more convenient to use that one. Bing Maps, uh, Microsoft has also a, a Maps and it's also quite, quite popular. Uh, it was very popular on the Windows phones but now the Windows phones are not so existing anymore so um, it, still has its, its, uh, its features and we will see a, a bit of how it differs from Google Maps. And MapQuest uh, I also presented here because um, it's a, it gives you a little more freedom than the other uh, services and we will see what I mean about that a little later. And this OSRM, the last one on the list, is not really a mapping service, it's a routing service it means that it gives you directions to how to find a place. It doesn't necessarily use a map, but it can be combined with any of the other uh, map services. And you can get directions using it and plot uh, the route on the map. So, uh, let's see what, what the features are. Uh, we can begin on the left and let's see this... Um, Okay, so uh, all of the map services have this JavaScript um, feature, means that you can develop for them using JavaScript. Uh, they all seem to be mobile friendly. Um, native support exists for Android and for iPhone at least. Bing Mac Maps has this uh, Windows Phone exception. And all of them seem to have basic features such as satellite view you are able to see this kind of uh, how it looks like from above without any uh, uh, semantic uh, objects there. By semantic objects I mean uh, streets or um, names of, of the roads or, or so on. Uh, when you use Google Maps you will see there the name of the street plotted on top of the street. So satellite view is just a, a picture that you get from, from above. Geocoding and reverse geocoding, this is something uh, you use quite often, maybe you are not sure what it means, but when you type something to search on the, on the map, you usually type it by name, you don't enter its coordinates, so let's assume that you want to search for Yoensu, you're going to search for Yoensu, and then the map system is going to somehow find out where are the coordinates from Yoensu, for Yoensu and then display it on the map. So this is called um, this is called geocoding and reverse geocoding you have the opposite. <coughs> so you give it coordinates and it's going to tell you what is at that location. So they are two features that uh, are used quite commonly and they are available in all of these different platforms. Routing, uh, like I mentioned this OSRM these, uh, these different uh, map systems also have embedded routing, so directions inside of them. And more recently they started also having traffic information, so they can tell you if a place is crowded or if a place is not crowded. And then we start to have more uh, advanced features. This bird's eye view is something that Bing Maps has, and it's essentially uh, they have went and they have taken pictures from airplanes more or less all over the world, in, in important places at least, so you can get a bird's eye view of, of what is around you. 
street view from Google. They went even further than that. They went with the car and they took pictures uh, from, from the different streets in, in uh, bigger cities. Also 3D view and a gaming API. So these are already kind of owned by Google. Um, you need a lot of uh, money and, and power to be able to, to get this kind of data and Google is, is uh, quite powerful and, and they collected this data and they also made it available for programmers to use in their, in their applications. So it's, um, yeah. Now, this is my only slide for today, so it's going to be quite a lot of uh, demonstration uh, of how these different systems work. But um, before that, I would like to say that um, I will focus on Google Maps in this course. And I decided to focus on Google Maps uh, last weekend, even though I made this uh, map quest exercises already for, for demonstrations already for the entire course. But something came up and um, a news came up that Google Maps is planning to release a Unity API. Unity is a game development platform. It's uh, more or less the platform in which many powerful mobile games are made. And now Google Maps is joining into this, uh, this gaming more seriously. And it was just announced last week that several new games are in the making using this new Google Maps Unity API and the games include Jurassic World, Harry Potter, Ghostbusters and Walking Dead. So these will appear probably this year and um, they will be like Pokemon Go competitors and this is one of the main reasons why I, I chose to um, focus on this because in the near future some new uh, features will be coming out from Google and I have a little bit of a video here uh, trying to see if it works so Google video no sound but it doesn't uh, matter What essentially they are doing is that they allow you to skin the 3D models of the buildings around depending on how you want them to look like. So you can make the buildings look um, in different themes and uh, this will have, I think, a lot of um, new users trying to play with Google Maps because it gives you a lot of customization uh, possibilities so it's one of the reasons why I, I choose to focus on this one. But also other reasons such as we will try Android native development later on. Uh, after two weeks, next week there is no lecture by the way, there will be just the uh, first exercise. Uh, so when we try the native implementation in Android, it will be Google Maps because Android and Google are more or less the same thing. So I want us to see how the Google Maps uh, web application will compare to the native application and if you keep the maps the same it's just going to be an even better comparison between what the native application and what the web application is like. And um, another reason why, why I think we will keep everything in Google Maps at least uh, after today, because today we will check a little bit about the, what the others are doing, is that it has most of the features, if you remember this, uh, this list here. So again, it enables you to do more than the other ones. And I will also speak about disadvantages, uh, but maybe after we start doing something practical and, and see what things are. So. Now I'm going to demonstrate a little bit about these features, uh, what I, I talked here, and uh, see exactly what they mean, because not everybody might know what they are. And for that I'm going to just open up a browser, and I'm going to go to Google Maps, and uh, see what Google has to offer, and then I'm going to open 
Bing Maps. And see the differences to, to the Google Maps. And um, I think this map quest is also in my list, so I will talk also a little bit about that. And finally, this OSRM. This is really cool. So this OSRM stands for Open Source Routing Machine. And it's open source. So if you remember in DAA course, we spoke a little bit about how you find these, uh, these shortest path between two, two different locations. And maybe there we mentioned this kind of a Dijkstra algorithm or uh, A star, or uh, I don't remember which algorithm we talked about, but they were quite slow. And because this project is open source, if you want to know how it is done in practice, what are the optimizations done there, then you can look at the source code because it's, uh, it's available and you can see how uh, these directions can be uh, obtained um, all over the world, basically. And we use it also in Mopsy for the directions, and we installed it on our server. So here I am using this, uh, this uh, OSRM, their own server, which computes the distance, but you can install it also locally and get even faster reaction times for your own application. So uh, that's the reason why I, I demonstrate it here. And this is OpenStreetMap on the, on the bottom here. So there are two different things, a mapping service and a routing service. The routing service just tells you which way to go, and now the mapping service displays this route uh, on the left. So you can combine this OSRM with anything. You can combine it with Google Maps, you can combine it with uh, this uh, MapQuest or Bing Maps or whatever if you want, even though uh, like I mentioned before, it is possible also in, uh, in these individual uh, software to get routing, you can also get it from an external place. And this is good for, to know for several reasons. Uh, one of them is limitations. So you see me here in Google. Uh, getting directions all the time, modifying my, my trajectory. Now my question is, do you think this is free? Which one? Uh, what I'm doing now in Google. Oh, uh, I think there's a limit. Yes, yeah. so there are limits. There are limits, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I think that something like 2,500 times I can do this per day. It might be that, it might be a bit more or less. I think they also have a concept of a trusted user, so if you demonstrate somehow that you are not a bot doing these uh, automatically, you might get up to 10,000 or even 100,000, but they do have a limit. So if you build your own application, you might want to install this kind of routing service on your system, and then you have no limits. So. Um, there is no, nothing in the Google uh, Terms of Service that says you have to use the one in Google if you want to build big um, applications. So, just like that, uh, some, some things for you to know about. Okay, but let's see what other things are, are inside here. So, um, I'm going to refresh the, the Google Maps and Right, so satellite view, we already talked a little bit about this, and here it includes also these labels, so um, some of the places have names and, and they can be, be seen, and this is where the geocoding is happening, so I'm, I'm typing Helsinki, and it knew where Helsinki is, so this is what geocoding means. If I zoom in to, to Helsinki, I will start to see already some kind of uh, details coming up and this 3D option on the right. So this 3D option, first of all, shifts the perspective. You don't see any more from the top, you see from the side. But the more you zoom in, the more the, the buildings start to resemble real buildings. So this is a 3D rendering that, uh, that the maps 
are doing um, and it's being updated every time you, you pan the map. I believe that this is done by, by some kind of LADAR uh, scanning, so you, you go up with some kind of laser system and you find out how tall the buildings are and then the textures are also coming from some image manipulation from the satellite view, so somehow putting the textures on the different buildings, but I don't know exactly how they are. They are doing it. It's just a it's just a guess. And then of course if you zoom in even more you start to get to the street view. So this is the uh, really expensive thing to get in a map system is to get the street view because you need money to have a car that goes and takes pictures from place to place and uh, and you can navigate this this system and uh, these are the labels I mentioned before like the name of the street is plotted on top of the of the map so quite powerful uh, tool I think and if I zoom back up up to this 3d view so these <coughs> textures the the pictures on top of these 3D objects that make them look like the buildings, these are the things that in the future, in the near future, Google will let you change. So they can let you change these, these buildings to look different, like a medieval theme or a futuristic theme or, or something like that. And I think it's probably going to attract many, many people into using it and uh, trying to make more unique applications. Uh, doesn't interest it, me in particular very much, but uh, I know game developers will be very, very happy to hear about that. <coughs> now, the difference if we look at Bing Maps is, um, first of all, when I zoom in, I'm not going to end up on Street View. So this is one, one of the problems, I mean, not problems, but uh, lacks of features. But what it does have is, if you right-click, you should see, okay, I think aerial view must be enabled. So aerial view is the same as this uh, satellite view from, from Google Maps. Um, but then you also have this option to right click and view bird's eye. So this is the bird's eye view that I, I mentioned before. And it looks like that. So it is essentially picture taken from some, some airplane. It goes into much more detail than the satellite view does and you can also rotate it 90 degrees so you can have this option on the right to rotate it in different ways this is science park by the way so uh, I think we are here <laughs> but uh, maybe I'm not sure, I, I don't know what this room is <laughs> um, in, inside the building, but somewhere there. Right, <clears throat> so, um, okay. Now, also very um, popular feature in Google Maps and also Bing Maps, for now I'm going to disable this, uh, this fancy map because I prefer the simplicity here, is that you can search for different things. So, um, for example, you can search for restaurants. And these restaurants are going to appear in your area where you are looking at on the map. Um, and, of course, they, some of them have different information like uh, telephone number or uh, um, web link address in written form. These are particularly useful and you if you develop using the Google Maps API you will have access to these so you can search and find real uh, real services near near to you of course the service has to be in Google's database so if somebody opens a restaurant tomorrow it might not be yet in in Google's database so everything has limitations and uh, uh, you just have to think what they are. Now, same situation can be done also with Bing. I'm not going to demonstrate that. But let's talk a little bit about this MapQuest. So, MapQuest, I'm again now in a 
Johansjo over Science Park. I see that it has uh, many uh, commercials here on the bottom, so it's one of the things why it's uh, uh, a bit more flexible and more free than the others. We will see what that, that means. And here I have options of, uh, well, um, I can do the same things as in the others, like uh, search for directions uh, or uh, uh, or items or places, services. So for instance, I can look for hotels. Maybe I just want all, all the hotels or... Uh, okay, it finds some, some information. So these would be places where you can stay in, in Yoensu and it also gives you some price for, for some of them. So it, it even is able to... to um, uh, find out that kind of uh, information automatically. But let's see what happens if I pressed food. I moved to US. <laughs> so the reason here is because this MapQuest is a US uh, service. It's uh, made in USA, so I believe that they are mostly uh, interested in getting the, the data there. They don't have any services closer than, than these ones to my location. Uh, and this is again the, a disadvantage because if you try to use these, these, uh, this API, you might not get information everywhere where you are. I'm not saying that if you use Google or, or Bing, you will always get what you want, but um, you will have more, it's more likely that those APIs work with you to get to, to create a better application. Um, okay. Now let's speak up a little bit about the disadvantages in Google. So it's very easy to go here and type Google Maps in terms of service. Uh, open the link and it's not very easy to read everything here. So this is something that uh, many people click that OK button, like uh, accept, like I read it and then they go, go away. But uh, here there are some, there is some information that you might need to know about. Um, and I'm going to show you some of it that you might find interesting. I use this Control F to search for word because uh, I think it's important uh, important word so general rules it seems like oops uh, something happened free access so your maps implementation must be accessible to general public without charge and must not require a fee-based uh, subscription or other fee-based restricted access. So basically if you want to make an application that gives you money in one way or another by having the people paying to you directly, not using ads or, or something else, uh, you cannot use this unless everything has an exception if you have a separate written agreement with Google such as this agreement here so you could get it but Google has to specifically give you permission to do it and most likely ask you for a fee so anytime it's giving you it's helping you to earn some money um, you kind of pay him pay it back a little bit now, if you look at the MapQuest terms of service, I also look for the word fee. <laughs> it also says the same, the same or, or similar thing. So, General restrictions, 
a fee to access MapQuest service that would generally be free available, freely available to users or MapQuest's consumer services. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know everything that, that, that is here, but what it generally means is you can't make a map system using this, this uh, API, leave it like that, not give any functionality and name it map radu or something and then start asking money from people to use it so it means that you cannot do it unless you bring new functionality into the into the system so it, they are the terms of services are different from from uh, from place to place from uh, api to api and where we saw that google has a lot of pros that you can do this and you can do that we see that it's it has these kind of hidden fees there. Like you can try to start to build a software and eventually you end up realizing that it's not legal what you're doing unless you contact and, uh, and uh, uh, read those services and see that everything is, is fine. But if you make your application for free or somebody to use for free or you get your money in another way, for example, having these uh, these ads like this map quest is uh, is showing here on top, then the restriction doesn't apply. So anyway, I just wanted to attract attention that there are many other things here, uh, but that is probably one of the most uh, the most important ones. And, uh, I think I have some one other note down. No, I think it's probably Yeah, I think that's the most important reason. All the others are kind of um, obvious. Like you would see that, uh, for instance, it might say there that if you use your Google Maps uh, somewhere, it must say there that it is using Google Maps. Or do not hide the Google logo when you are uh, creating the Google Maps. So they have rules for everything, but most of them are kind of uh, common sense. Uh, but that, that one with the pricing is something that uh, you must keep in mind. So you can build a very good application using this, but you can build one that you might even <coughs> earn uh, money without having to pay back in some situations using this one, even though it might not be as good. All right, so this is general view on things. So what is available and... Um, and uh, what are the pros and cons of each of them? Um, I didn't mention that there are many other maps here. So, map systems and map a a APIs that you can use, they are, they are a bunch of them. And uh, if you Google for a list of, of them, you will find out. Uh, Yahoo has a maps, here has a maps. There used to be Nokia maps, but now they, they moved to, to here, I think. Um, open layers is something that is uh, also very, very popular. It, uh, it's allowing you to, to build very similar applications as, as all the other ones. For example, well, it will look like that. You just load the, it's a map system that allows the same kind of uh, functionalities, and in this case it uses OpenStreetMap data. So, uh, I think we move on to see how to build a, a map application, and again I will focus on Google Maps, the examples will be in Google Maps, but in this lecture today I will show that the other map systems have very similar uh, way of implementing things. So it's not more difficult to do it in the other. It might be a little bit different, but uh, it's possible to do more, most of the things there too. And how do we develop for Google Maps? 
Well, we search for Google Maps API in the, in the top. And we go to this link, which is the developers for, for maps of, uh, of Google. And we see here already this Android and iOS support that I mentioned before. And something about pricing and plans. So this is always to keep in mind because these are very powerful things. So you do expect them to ask money for you. They, they never did them for free. But I think all of them have something that they give for free. So in this case, um, I think that there are a lot of descriptions about what is free and what is not free and what I think Bilal was mentioning before, this number of requests, so how many requests, in this case for Places API, so the Places API gives you restaurants and these, these kind of objects uh, near you, but you also have for the Directions API, yeah, and I was right to, to guess that uh, 2,500 uh, are free per day. After that, it will just stop working. So, unless you you buy more. Right, so you can get uh, information about that, but if you are building and playing and trying to learn with, uh, to learn how to build an interface uh, or an app, you don't have to pay anything because these limits, these uh, request limits are high enough. So they will not really uh, impact your creativity in any way. It's just when you have something really good and you want to start to make a company or, uh, or whatever, sell your product, then you might start to have problems when you have millions of users and uh, these limits are not enough. Okay, so, um, so going, yes? In, the, in these prices and tax they have, there was this asset tracking. Do you know if it needs any legal requirements as well, other than Google concern? Asset tracking. Oh, here. I am not sure what that is. So, it seems... Uh, <coughs> You must pay for it. Is it this thing that if you lose your device, you, you can find it? I was also thinking, but because it also said people, so I was wondering, can you like freely track the phone number, for example? Because that sounds a bit creepy. Mm -hmm. that maybe like the government could do, like the police, for example, but not everybody. Okay. I have to say that I, I don't know what, what the... What the it is there, but I believe it's about, um, I believe that if you want to track some assets, then you have to define your database of assets that you are going to track. So I don't think that anybody has access to track a phone number. But uh, you must have your device, if it's an iPhone or, um, or whatever, a smart microwave oven, <laughs> give, give its ID to Google and Google will tell you where your microwave oven is going to be. But I'm not sure, so this is just what I, I think it's working like. Um, i never seen this before, and uh, <laughs> these pages are changing almost on a monthly basis, so... And, uh, oh yeah, I didn't show you in that uh, page with the um, um, terms of services, but Google also reserves the right to change its terms of services any time it wants. So, <laughs> so um, it's also something that you, you have to consider that what it promises today might not still might not work anymore tomorrow and um, it's again a disadvantage but if you take into account making the application from scratch so going out and making your own map then it's, it's undoable so you have no choice but to kind of agree to these things and it's not just Google but uh, everybody is having the same kind of uh, policies. All yeah, right. The, yeah. There is, the, there is the question about the terms. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you have a business and uh, you want to uh, 
uh, input the maps to your net site. Uh, should you make a, some kind of contract with the Google? Yes, yes, so you must tell Google that you are earning something from this. And uh, I didn't check the, there was this, there was a link there in the terms of services to the page where the contract is. So that contract, I think, says that if you are earning something, you must give some amount of this earning to Google as a, as a compensation. Or there must, or there might be a fixed uh, amount that you pay uh, per month or per uh, per year to be able to use it. Uh, it was that, uh, that uh, the price is, is connected to the uh, how many users. Uh, y yes, uh, th that's true. Uh, they have different planning, uh, different uh, pricing uh, for different features, so if you are having a, a large amount of users, they might ask a proportional amount to that. Uh, 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 one, all right, thank you. Yeah, so uh, going back from this pricing and, and plans, uh, I'm not very good at knowing this information here because we don't have a <coughs> paying up and uh, I didn't worry too much about it, but it's important for you to know. Uh, and all of them have it, so even if you go to MapQuest, which is like the, the, the most free of them all, uh, they also have pricing, because you cannot make an application that has millions of users and expect to use their service and, uh, and uh, not have limitations. So their servers have also physical limitations, so they do limit the number of calls per day or per week or, or so on and to enable more of them you have to pay a certain value. So um, you must pay to remove these limitations or to set them even higher even if you don't have a app that brings you money because there are limits to their, their systems. So the difference with the Google is that if you get money in Google, it doesn't matter how much uh, traffic you have, you must sign an agreement that Google lets you continue to use their, uh, their application legally. So, different things, but of course somebody needs to read all of those to, to understand everything. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, Let's move on to this get started button and see where we are going. We are going on a page that's, uh, that tells us what are the APIs that Google offers. So here we see the Android uh, APIs. So we have Google Maps and Google Places. This was the restaurants and hotels and, and different things. Same available for iOS. And then web APIs, this is what we will do today. In the native, we are going to use this one. So uh, two different APIs, quite similar, but uh, not, not exactly the same. And then the web APIs, we're going to use the JavaScript one. Google Places is also available, and uh, Street View API, and the geocoding, what we talked before. Distance matrix is uh, something, uh, I don't know why it has that name, because it's very uh, nerdy, but um, if you give it a set of 10 places, it's going to tell you all the distances between every two places using the road network. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it could be useful when solving the traveling salesman problem, like uh, what is focusing on. Uh, Roads API, Google Places here also. Um, geolocation API, so this is uh, getting your location from your phone. Uh, we already saw how to do that without Google uh, last time, but uh, it's possible. Directions is the routing and elevation gives you for a point on the earth how far uh, on top of the sea level it is. 
So useful things that we can use, but for now we, we focus on this JavaScript API. I click on it and um, I see that there are some tutorials here, some very simple uh, applications that are made using it. And the demos have also this kind of uh, sample code that are uh, available there. Uh, I'm just going to cl click these samples or, or see them all. I think they, they go to the same page. And um, look a little bit on the left. So on the left here, I will have a simple map, uh, coordinates, geolocation. So examples that um, illustrate the different, different things on, uh, that you can do with the map. And I think we will start with the simple markers because it has the word simple in it and uh, it is just a marker placed on a, a specific location and I have the code here that I could try to copy it and that is what I, exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the code and I'm going to copy it in a new folder it is now called Superman uh, on the CS server, so the reason for that we will see later, I hope. Uh, yeah, so this new folder has now an uh, index.html file inside it, and I'm going to paste it here. I'm going to save the file and refresh the page, and everything is not right. <laughs> so something is wrong. Oh my. See the JavaScript console for technical details. Okay, so this thing is assuming that I am somehow um, good with my development skills and I know how to open this console. If you remember, it's the F12 from, from last time. And here it says that there is a warning coming because there is an invalid key. Okay. I go back to my demo, so what is really this key thing? I have not heard of that. I didn't read the terms of services, but I have this big button here that says get a key. Okay, I get the key. Uh, in this case, I already got a key before, but I'm going to request a new one, I think. What is this key? It's a, it's a hash, it's, a, it's an ID, a value that will uniquely identify my application, whatever I am going to build, or applications. I think you can use it in, in multiple, I'm not sure. Uh, if you check the, this console from here, it will tell you what you can do with this key. So it's not, uh, it's not, um, I, I don't know all the, the functionalities, but I copy this key, I go back to my source code, I look through it, it's a bit complicated, but it has this text, your API key. I paste it there, I save the file, and I go back to my simple markers. Uh, demo that I copied there, I refresh, and now it seems like it, the warning message is not coming anymore. So this key, why is it needed? Uh, multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, you might actually want to purchase something from Google, so they want to know where to send the bill. This key is the link from your um, credit card or whatever if you add it there into their system. Uh, to the app or apps that you are going to make. It also prevents uh, bot um, calls, so it doesn't allow somebody to just use Google Maps forever on multiple computers and, uh, and call like intensely. Let's assume that Bing wants to make Google slow, so it's going to buy a thousand computers and it's going to 
call randomly th difficult things for Google to calculate, they need to get a key for each of those, and uh, they can be tracked what was, what was this attack happening. And also to count the things. So you have your app and you have the 2,500 direction queries per day. This key stores the, will be used to associate the, the numbers, so how many times they have happened in your application, and your application has this key. Okay, so great, the marker is there. Um, it says there, hello world, if I hover the, the mouse over it. And now I will look a little bit at this source code. So, some styling here that, what it does, it make, makes the page fill the window and it, it creates the map, a map div um, and when the map is loaded from Google, it will call this init map function. It will create an object with the latitude and the longitude. It instanti instantiates the, the, the map in, uh, in this div, in this map div, with a zoom of 4 and the center of these coordinates that I have here. I just change now the zoom to 2 to see what happens. Refresh this. Okay, so now I'm a bit more up seeing Australia. And a marker. Note, note that everything seems to have google.maps in the beginning because it is um, the way that you know that if you create your own map object in JavaScript, it's going to be different from the Google Maps map. So. Uh, these are all uh, objects that exist in the Google Maps library and the marker has also the same position it's placed on the map and it has a title of hello world um, now because I maybe want to access these objects later on I will take them and I will make them global variables so if I keep them in this function, they cannot be accessed anywhere away from this function. And I don't want that. I want to build an application starting from this example. And I also don't like the way that Google aligned the things here for me. So bear with me for a second. So this map, usually I name things with G underscore if they are global variables, they will be very uh, easy to track later on. I need to know uh, to now also modify this uh, gmap there. And I'm also going to uh, make the marker as a, as a global variable. So um, this is not really indicated. The map fits <coughs> because, well, there is only one map here, but markers, many applications have many markers, so you shouldn't have global variables for that. You should do something else. But now the application I want to build has one marker, so I, I can take it out as a, as a global variable here. I'm going to refresh the page. Okay, and the reason why, I, one of the reasons why I made them global is because now I can access them in this console. So, because they are global, they can be accessed anywhere. And I want to see, uh, I to use this console because it's gonna, this console lets you program very efficiently. So, you can try out different JavaScript uh, directly in the console, and then when you're happy with the result, you can take it back into the, into the source code. For example, um, well, I can find out the location of the center of the map without going in the in the uh, in the source code and printing something out. So I can I can do this kind of manipulation. I can take the marker, for example. Um, I can set the map to null. The marker goes away. 
uh, I can set it back to GMAP as before and marker comes back. So I can have this uh, uh, real-time coding using this, this console and it's something that uh, it's one of, I think, the most important development skills that, that you should learn from this course. You save a lot of time using it. And uh, all other browsers have the same, so you can use it in uh, Firefox or Edge or uh, Internet Explorer, Safari. They, they all have some uh, developer consoles, but I prefer the one from Google. And let's just say that since I'm using Google now, I want to stick with one uh, company and <laughs> not, not spread too, too much. Right. Okay. So what, what else can I do uh, here in the console? Maybe I can make this... Mm, mm, let's go back to the examples. If I want to learn something about this marker, so I'm using now the Google Maps marker object. It has a position and a map and a title here, but maybe this sample uses only part of the things. Maybe, maybe it... Uh, Google actually lets you do more with this mark. So, if I search for this this object, okay, it doesn't seem to find anything there. Okay, um, I need to go to this reference uh, to this reference page. So this is the documentation of of, um, of Google Map API. And if I go to the drawing on the map, I will get this marker object. And this Google Maps marker object, I will find out all the possible things that I can do with it. So this parameter that sets it up, I click this marker options. And I will find out here the map. I will find the position and I will find the title that were used in the sample. But I see that there are many other things that can be done using it. Um, like some animation things, some anchor points and, and so on. Okay. Now, let's try to use something, uh, something else from here. And uh, I named this, uh, this project Superman because uh, I didn't have any better idea and in the next two or three minutes I'm going to teach you how to draw Superman in, um, in PowerPoint. So bear with me for, for a second. Uh, okay, the reason why, why I'm really teaching you this is um, multiple reasons uh, actually. It's basically because in today's world it's kind of important to have applications that look good. And I don't claim that I know how to make things look good, but um, at least I try. And uh, if you check out like very popular software, um, they don't have a very bad user experience. So they are usually committed to making the uh, interface as, as clean as, po as possible and as useful as possible, uh, much more important than just the feature that it, uh, that it gives. So you have the one, one system that um, looks good and another one that provides better quality result. It's very likely that the one that looks good and it's easy to use uh, will become more popular, even though it doesn't make sense. So it's something that you should not, not take for granted. And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm really the artist. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and also you have this PowerPoint that uh, I think that many people are using it for uh, <clears throat> um, many different reasons. Um, but you can also use it to draw different things quite quite nicely. So if you're ever complaining that you don't have a, a very good uh, drawing tool, you might want to learn PowerPoint a bit better, and um, I think they give it for free in the, on the university computers nowadays. All right, so I think this is going quite 
Fantastic. <laughs> That's pretty good. So. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Very, very important trademark. This goes on top. Right, I'm gonna group it and I, I, I make it small because I want it to be the size of a marker. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna right click and save the picture as something, maybe soup, many other pictures there. <laughs> um, and as a PNG. So, now, in this directory, I'm going to create a, a new directory. I'm going to call it images. I think I'm going to have just one image, this one that I drew now, but uh, um, it's good to plan ahead and not have to change it uh, later on. I'm going to copy it. Oh, oops. Sorry, this is another one. I didn't prepare to... Uh, use this computer for everything today, but now I kind of have to do it. So, uh, if, I'm not sure if you saw it before, but I'm going to use this icon property of the marker, and I'm just going to put it here. So it's going to be in images soup. I don't think I need this title anymore. <coughs> the extension. So, Okay, yeah, great. Uh, kind of big, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's... I don't like it. It's too, too big, so I'm going to make it a bit smaller. And notice that now these uh, lines here are a bit too big for my, my taste, so I'm going to make them even smaller. Yes? How do these works would we see the fold from anywhere? Uh huh. Yes. Or or the JavaScript part or is it is it is it coming from the server or can we see it? Yes. Yes, so if you are in the browser, usually you can right click and view any, any page source like this. But uh, usually with these Google Maps, right click means something else. But here this control plus U will still work. So if you go back here to our example and press control plus U, it's going to open what we are building now, so the, the source code. What about the if the key is available? Can you repeat? Uh, the, the key is available? Uh, is yeah, I think the key is visible unless you, unless you specifically uh, hide it. There are some ways that you can hide it, but it's not... Uh, I don't know how to do it without doing some research first. Okay. So but, uh, maybe if you make some kind of uh, application, it's important. To yes, it. yes. You can put the key somewhere on your server in a text file that only you can access, and then this um, this HTML five file that we have here um, that we have here. You turn it into a PHP file. That PHP file reads the key from the server, from the hidden place that you has that you have, and you give it to Google that way. So it is possible to do it, but I, I think it takes a little bit of effort, and I'm not going to show you now. Okay. But PHP and store the key on the server, then you will not see it here in this uh, in this source anymore. But is it usually? Uh, that way, that way, if we broke that kind of HTML code, we uh, put something that we don't want to uh, display. Yes, um, 
Okay. Yeah, so here uh, you, you, you would get the code very well. There are, there are some ways of hiding this code, some uh, ways of encrypting your page, but this is already assuming you have such a good, good application that you are one step from becoming commercial. So meanwhile, it's better to have it this way because you can debug easily using uh, keeping it unencrypted, <coughs> uh, unencrypted okay. the page. But uh, yeah, good good point. If you look here, when I press this Google marker object, um, many of the values are very strangely named. So they are values that the API doesn't want you to know what they are. You have some parameters that you can, can change uh, here. But uh, what is not necessary, it's being encrypted or it's being uh, minimized so that uh, it's not, not shown necessarily. And if you go to some professional web page, everything will look scrambled like this. So it is possible to do it and it's not too difficult, but uh, we can discuss about it later, I think. All right, but let's go back to our example and do some things here. So I'm going to write a function that says move superman and this function is going to be taking our G marker and it's going to set position new position. So where am I going to move it? Well, I'm going to get the new position Somewhere in Finland, I think, maybe, I'm not sure. And now I refresh this page, go to the console, and I write move Superman. In the console, I write it, and Superman is somewhere in Finland now. Yeah, great, fantastic. Let's put him already in Finland to start with, because uh, I don't think he visited Finland before. And now note that the map is also going to center wherever this place is in Finland. So I'm going to refresh and it's not over Australia any, anymore. Uh, but I don't want to just move Superman there now. I want to move him somewhere else. So I'm going to get the marker's position. Okay. And I'm going to say that I want... Uh, okay, uh, old position, and I want to say that the new position, it's a new uh, location. I will show you also how to use this Google Maps LAT LNG object. It's optional, but I can I can use it here. Old position dot LAT. Um, so I will put the new position the same latitude as the old position but I will put the longitude to be maybe plus one so I'm going to move the Superman guy relative to his current position by by one so it went to the right one step. If I write it again, it's going to move some, somehow. But let's move him automatically. So in HTML you have a timer object um, method. I think it is set timeout. Set timeout. So I want to set timeout uh, move Superman again after let's say 10 milliseconds so let's see what happens now I refresh the page I call move Superman 
and Superman just moves because the function calls itself. It's somehow like a recursive function. Oh, how did that happen? Yeah, so I just increased the longitude. But the map knows that if you exceed this um, edge of the screen, he's going to come back from the, from the left side of the screen. Um, so zooming out looks, looks something like that. Okay, this is quite, quite nice. Uh, he's, he's pretty fast, yeah. But how fast is he? So now that, that's the question that I want to know. So how fast is Superman? And maybe let's make his, uh, yeah, let's make a line that he leaves behind, like a trail. So that is also possible if I go back to our uh, examples here from Google Maps you will see this um, at some point something with polygons I think maybe this one maybe, maybe here many examples so this is something that you can look for yourself and, and figure out and then there is this polyline option which seems to look like that so I, I will take it and try to adapt for what I, I need to do here. I want to make a line from his old position to the new position every time he's going to move. So I already move him to the new position here. I have the old one. So the path object, what is this path object? It seems to be an array of these different locations. Let's just see how that works. So I'm going to define path as a new array. And I'm going to add to it the old position. Uh, sorry. Push is the function. So this array works kind of like a stack. And I'm also going to add the new position. And then the path goes as the parameter to the polyline. Oh, yeah. There's a typo. Path.push. Yes. Thank you. I hope it's correct now. And then some other parameters. Let's just uh, keep them there for now. Let's see if it really changes anything. I'm not sure. No, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is probably because uh, I don't have the polyline added to any map. So here the marker gets a map where to be on it. And the polyline in this example doesn't have the, the, mm, this object there. Let's see first if it works. Maybe it's not the reason. Okay, so it is the reason. And if I go back to the sample, this simple polylines example so here the map is not there but the flight path, path is set to the map later so you can do m things in many different ways it's it's not the one uh, just a simple one way to do it but can be multiple ways can you, can you track the position of the map? yes so let's do that now so I want to find out where he is when I press a button Okay. Also, let's make him draggable. So, how difficult it is, um, I, if I remember right. I'm not sure, but uh, yes. So, now I can put him anywhere I want before he, he starts to do his uh, Superman move. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, so let's make him. Uh, let's find out where he is. I'm going to make another div here, empty it. Um, I will style it here because I'm running out of time. This is just some uh, HTML code. Um, I'm going to put it on the top and I'm going to put it on the right. And I'm going to write a button here. Um, 
with a function on click uh, where is Superman. So, all right, I'm going to close the button and I'm going to refresh the page to see if the button is there. Okay, button, I think it is this one, but it doesn't have a label, so I'm going to write a label for it. Where? Okay, so now when I press the button, it says that an error that where is Superman is not defined. So let's find out where he is. Function where is Superman? Uh, let's print it to the console. So console log g marker get position. And I think I need a two string to print it out so that it's visible. Uh, okay, let's not put the two string so that you learn what the two string does. Uh, I'm going to refresh the page. I'm going to press the where. And I get these kind of difficult things here. It says that LAT is a function. So it's not an attribute. If I look at the function, it's somehow encrypted. It's uh, not meant for me to see that value. Uh, I could get the latitude independently here with the function that it does have there. Uh, whoops, sorry. So I could get the latitude, uh, but I could also put the two string just to format the, the result, and it's going to give me the latitude and the longitude in, in this form. And now I'm going to have Superman fly. <laughs> And whenever I press this, this button, I'm going to get a new new result, and it's going to tell me where he is at a given time. But maybe I want to know what is really the city or town where Superman is. So now I'm going to look at another example. I'm going to try to use this geocoder, uh, geocoder from Google. So to find out from the coordinates, I already have the coordinates. Let's find out what is the name of the place. So, also in the samples, the geocoding service, I can enter a name of the place and I get the coordinates, but if I do the reverse geocoding, I enter the coordinates and I get the name of the place. So this is what I want to do and I'm just going to look to see how they do it. I ac actually don't know how they do it. Uh, Yeah, so this is the code. Geocoder is defined here. And it's called here somehow. Let's let's see how this works. So it's defined there, it's called here uh, with the parameter this LAT LNG. So I want to put him the position of Superman, so this will be the parameter. And now, this is a callback function, so it's a function that will be called after Google gives me the geocoding result. It has to call one of its servers to do that. Uh, and I'm reading quickly now, I hope no mistake, but um, if the result is okay, and if there are results, I don't want to do anything that the example is doing, I want to log to the console um, the result, this result of zero. So the first result, because when you are doing reverse geocoding, um, it's possible you get, okay, when you're doing geocoding, it's possible to get multiple results in general. Uh, for example, you type in um, Kirkokatu, and there are many Kirkokatu streets in, in the world, so this is just a general behavior, but maybe you get more results, so here we use the first, the first results from there. First result from there. Okay, um, back to this, where, okay, so location is there, but what is this thing, so 
address components. Uh, he ended up being in Rantasalmi, <laughs> so my my random location is not now has a name. Okay, so I could for take this formatted address component and print that one out if I want, but I can also get the uh, components individually here. Um, the country, its short name, the name of the street, the name of uh, the actual address, so it's possible to do them like that. But I will just for print the formatted address because it's too much text here on the, on the right. So now we should be able to find out where he is exactly uh, also by also by a name All right. and one thing that you might want to see here is that when I'm pressing it and you might not be able to see this well but when I press this coordinates come but the address comes a little later. Mm. It's because it takes time for Google to talk to its server to find out what is at this coordinate and then uh, return it to, to us. So this is how the geocoder works, basically. Now, I will try to do one more thing. I think so. so here I'm, I'm just demonstrating to you how to make a marker on the map, how to customize the marker, how to draw lines. You can draw them in any way. This line is boring. If you have seen the movie, um, I think that he wasn't just following exactly the same line all the time. So I'm going to add a value to this latitude also. A random value. I'm going to subtract 0 0.5 from it because random value is between 0 and 1 and I want it to also have negative values. Mm. And I'm going to do it again. So let's see now what happens. Now he's like... Uh, <laughs> now he's doing... Yeah, now he's doing signal processing. It's kind of... Uh, kind of looks like that. <laughs> okay, but anyway, he's... Now you see a little better how this trajectory looks like. So it's the same as you tracking, but we are not using the geolocation. We're simulating his, his movement. Okay. Uh, and I don't like this red. I think it's too too much. Let's make it uh, let's make it black. It's uh, it's too striking in a way. So this this is just me changing parameters here, and showing what it is possible. Now let's link to our yesterday's lecture. Somehow, I want to calculate Superman's speed. So, how fast is he moving? Because uh, it can be useful <laughs> to, to find out. So, I want to get here speed, the instantaneous speed between his old position and his new position, right? Mm -hmm. Every moment, I want to see the speed. So, to get that, I need the distance. I also need the time. These are usually the components that you can get. For now, I'm going to do a hack here because I don't have time. I'm going to put into this marker, I'm going to write a parameter that says time there, uh, an attribute time. I'm going to put it as new date it's this okay and now I'm going to calculate also the time the new time so the new time and okay time difference between the old position and last position and the new position is going to be the new time minus this G marker time because this was set in the previous in the previous repeat. Hope you, you are following this. But um, console log time difference should now print every time he's moving a number. And this is a time difference in milliseconds. Note that 
I set my timeout to repeat every 10 milliseconds. So why is it not just 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 there? Does anybody know? Is the timeout called by this code or asynchronously? Okay, so if the browser is busy with something, it might delay this, this timeout. And actually, because this map is getting more and more complicated, more and more lines are being added here, this will start to take longer and longer and your map will start to become more difficult to, to work with. And, um, okay, now he's somewhere. <laughs> this is the power of randomness. You really don't know what, when he will decide to do that, but uh, he can do that. Okay, note also another thing. The numbers now are, now are about 1, 10, 20. If I do this, these numbers get higher because now the, now the map is processing more. It's, it's, I'm giving it more work to do. So this is what, what he was saying there in the back before, I, I think. Okay, anyway. So basically the time uh, recording is not the same as what we programmed the time to, to go, the, the base of the, uh, the time. Oh boy, okay. So, uh, let's go back to our previous example, this Lamad, Lamad Earth. And our distances project. And I'm going to take from here something. I need to take this WGS to XYZ conversion. So, okay, function get distance P1, P2. Uh, okay, WGS1, WGS2. So these are the latitude, longitude. Uh, values and I'm going to do that, convert it into a XYZ to right, this radius needs to be defined here, the radius of the earth, I'm going to speed up a little bit but uh, you should be able to follow this if you were in the yesterday's, yesterday's lecture and now um, with these different values, I'm going to compute the Haversine distance. So I'm going to get Haversine distance of XYZ1 and XYZ2. And okay, this radius comes here also in the Haversine distance, so I'm going to um, modify it so that it's the parameter here. Hope you are able to follow. Okay, and this Haver sign uses the Euclidean distance, so this is becoming quite quite messy here. But uh, bear with me. It's just making. Yeah. yeah? It, it was good idea to separate uh, these five parts like uh, yesterday you did. Yeah. I will now also teach you, hopefully, if I have time, how to put these fu functions somewhere else because this file is becoming very complicated. Mm -hmm. So all of these are about... Okay, let's do it now. So all of these are about distance calculation, right? I'm going to remove them from here, I'm going to save the file, and in the Superman I'm going to make a new file called distance.js, so a new javascript file I'm just going to paste the functions in here in this new javascript file and in HTML I'm going to essentially well, include this script here so where is the script Should be above so that yeah I think so. you're right. Do you know how to write this because I don't remember yeah, source. 
Is it like this? Yeah. Okay, and so. Then, uh, something like that, maybe. So. Let's just see if it works. So I'm going to refresh now the page. Okay, uh, many errors. <laughs> so, so, errors there. Init map is not a function. Uh, I think that this script. I think you can't, uh, you have to do another slash script, not in it with it. Maybe. Okay, maybe. Okay, and now if I type haver sign, it's here. So, um, something works, but um, I'm a bit skeptical, did I copy everything here or not? I guess we will just find out. So, separated the functions quite quickly so that they are not disturbing me in my project and I just load them from external file. And now, I have the time difference there, but the distance is going to be um, get distance between two WGS uh, values there. Okay. And I will have to do one more change, I realize now. So the distance is going to be get distance of old position and new position. And let's put also the distance next to the time printing it there to see if it somehow works. So, like that. And I know this is a bit... Okay, these are Google objects, these, these latitude, longitude objects. And they don't have the attribute LAT, they have the method LAT. And our problem is going to be here in this function. It calls the method, the attribute LAT. So these will need to be slightly modified now, or I need to convert them into the objects that we created yesterday. It's, it's because now we use this Google way of representing the location that uh, it's causing a little, a little problem. It doesn't work. <laughs> So, why it doesn't work? We are getting the distance of, of two different places because we are not returning it. So we are not returning anything from this function. I think that this should, should fix it. If somebody sees something suspicious. Okay. So he's going about 50 kilometers in 10 milliseconds. So pretty good, but this is uh, okay. Let's format the speed somehow. So I know the distance now, and this distance is going to be kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. The time difference at this stage is going to be milliseconds. So if I'm gonna want to calculate the speed. Uh, speed is distance of the camera. Yeah. Time difference. But this is going to be kilometers in milliseconds. Mm. Okay, Superman is fast. If you remember, the speed of light was something like 300,000 kilometers per second. So let's multiply, uh, let's divide this time difference by 1000 and get it instead of milliseconds into seconds. And now find out Superman speed in terms of kilometers per second. So, yeah. So let's print now the speed only, not anymore these other values. Wow, really? So fast? I think it's correct. Uh, look over him going over Finland and count in your head like one, two, three, four. 
I think this looks reasonably good. Uh, including also this zigzaggy effect that is that is being happening there. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm gonna make this zigzaggy effect much less. I'm gonna divide here by maybe ten. It's a bit too difficult to, to track. And I'm gonna make him much faster. So let's put here instead of plus one plus. 30, let's say. So, much faster. Okay, notice that this path has a form here, a shape, a curve all the time. This is because of our property here, geodesic. So, if I remove this property from the polyline, it's going to be indeed a, a straight line. Um, it's just a property that you can change how it looks like so it resembles the curvature of the Earth. So the geodesic means this uh, Haver sign uh, distance, basically. Now, he is much faster now. I'm, I'm going to make him a bit slower. I think that this speed, sometimes it's getting close to the light, but uh, anyway, it was just a, a joke. I don't want him to go the speed of light. Um, but what I want to show, one last thing here, is um, related to our lecture from yesterday. I'm going to make him even slower than that. Uh, this distance calculation, you might take a look into it. I'm not 100% sure what I did here is totally correct, but I think it is. So if I find some error in it, I will let you know. Uh, what I want to show you, and I think it's quite important, is He's moving now with speeds of uh, about 3,000 kilometers per second, right? Mm -hmm. According to our distance function. Mm -hmm. But if you remember, um, I can drag Superman. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's trying to escape, but uh, anyway, I'm dragging him to equator. And now he's going much faster. Okay, I'm going to remove the zigzagginess completely. I'm just going to leave it fi fixed because now he's going to go and I'm going to print the distance instead of the speed. Because now it's almost fixed, so this time difference that is being caused by the uh, um, the timer in, in JavaScript is less affecting. So now every time he moves, he moves 52 kilometers. I'm going to take him and I'm going to move him south. And when I let him go, he's going to move 103 kilometers. Do you know why? It's faster. Hmm? Faster, yeah. yeah. No, longer. Long and distance. yes, um, the, the speed is actually the same. I, I mean, uh, okay, it's it's faster. Sorry, sorry, it's faster. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but my question is why, and it's going to be fastest on the equator. That's where the radius is. The biggest. Yeah. That has. Yeah, so when he's now going on the equator there, he's basically following this line. And I just told him to go um, one degree in longitude to the right. Mm. So in 360 steps, so after 3600 milliseconds, he will go around the, the equator. But if I move him higher up where Finland is, here, he will just have to go around this circle um, in uh, 3,600 uh, milliseconds. So he will go a less distance, a smaller, smaller distance. But essentially, because the degree value is going to be the same, 
this distance here is going to be larger than here, so his speed is also going to be faster if I just move him into to the equator. So trying a little bit to explain to you that he looks to move the same speed, so no matter where I put him, he moves at the same apparent speed to us after the projection. But if you remember, the more you go up, the more distorted this Mercator projection is. So this Greenland, uh, even though he, he, he would look like, like um, crossing, yeah, crossing Greenland at the same rate as he crosses, crosses Africa, um, Greenland is much smaller in real life than what this projection looks like. So counterintuitive a little bit, but I just wanted to demonstrate this, uh, this aspect in, in practice. Right. Uh, I think I will modify this code a little bit to clean some of the things out and uh, uh, and check this distance calculation if it's really correct or not. I, I think it is, but I, I don't have time to debug now. So, sorry for taking a bit extra time, but uh, so I hope you like it. <laughs>